Welcome to the Wickedly Smart Women podcast, featuring stellar conversations with emerging and established Wickedly Smart Women. Thanks for joining us today as we celebrate women who are committed, care deeply, and have the courage to take action and create conscious change all around the world. Now here's your Wickedly Smart host, Angel B. Hartwell. Welcome to another episode of the Wickedly Smart Women podcast, where we celebrate Wickedly Smart Women and provide our listeners with a wealth of wisdom, along with immediately actionable steps to be smarter, spunkier, and more successful in their impact and their leadership. This is your host, Angel B. Hartwell, and today we welcome our special guest, Duraya Benferhat. Duraya was born in Morocco and raised in Algeria. She holds a master's in bilingual education from Georgetown University and has been teaching since the 1970s. She doesn't look like it. (laughs) She has taught Arabic, French, English, and Spanish to learners of all ages. For 36 years, she taught Arabic at the United Nations Language Program at the New York headquarters and retired in 2017. She enjoys the privilege of teaching people from all over the world and learning from her exceptional students. After raising three multilingual children, she now enjoys teaching languages online and sharing information about languages in her books, blog, podcast, and YouTube channel. And she loves to travel. I met Duraya on Clubhouse. And she's so, you know, wickedly smart (laughs) and incredible with all of her accomplishments that I just knew that she would be a great fit for the show. So welcome to the show, Duraya. Thank you for having me, Angel. Pleasure to be here. Well, you know, I mentioned when I was reading your introduction that I can't even believe that you've been teaching since the 1970s because you look about 35 years old. (laughs) Thank you. So So have you been teaching since you were in the womb? Is that what happened? Were you like, did you teach all of your friends in the neighborhood (laughs) when you were like six? (laughs) I started teaching when I was in college. I was actually teaching. There was no online at that time. So it was by correspondence. So I would correct students' copies in Arabic and French. And then later on in English, when I, I think in the second or third year, I started doing English as well. It was a good way to start teaching. Mm, Beautiful. Um, So teaching has, was teaching in your family? Was there, you know, something in, did you come from a long line of teachers? Like what was it that inspired you to step into that role of teacher? My dad was a teacher and then he was a principal and then he was he worked in the Ministry of Education. I have several uncles who are teachers, but I think the people who who inspired me the most are my teachers and professors, especially female teachers and professors. Uh, especially female teachers yes, and professors. Well, coming from from a country where women don't always have the chance especially you know at at my time when i was young to do as much as men i really looked up to these women who were who were teaching us and i wanted to be one of them mm. i became one of them i'm very happy about that beautiful well we're happy about that too so can we talk a little bit about your culture and you know, was it in your family, were you encouraged to get educated and be, you know, a voice for women? Because typically, you know, from what we see in Western culture, when we look with our own, you know, obviously flawed eyes at Arabic culture, we often see and maybe even project that there's a lot of suppression of the feminine there. So I'd love to have you speak a little bit about you know, your own personal experience, as well as what was it about your own environment that allowed you to become who you are? I grew up with four brothers, and they were younger than me. And my parents were very open minded, especially my dad. Like when my mom would say, so so my my brothers would be outside playing and and she would say, well, you know, you need to fix the, the beds. And I'm like, why do I have to fix their beds? They could fix their own beds. You know, my dad would say, no, they have to fix their their own beds. You know, mm-hmm. you, you, 
you don't have to fix their beds. But at the same time, I was not really playing outside as much as they were. You know, I I could have play dates with friends. I could go meet them outside, but I was not allowed to go to their homes. They were not allowed to come to my home. The, my parents were very protective because I was the only daughter. And it's just one example. However, my parents were also, as I said, very open-minded. And when I was in college, my dad encouraged me to go to England to improve my English. And I stayed uh, three years in a row for five weeks with uh, a British family. I would spend uh, five weeks with them. And of course, that really helped my English and helped me be a better English teacher <laughs> mm-hmm. later. And it helped me also when I came to the U.S. to study. Mm. Um, Beautiful. So you you came from an environment where you were encouraged to study, where you were encouraged to, to speak and to be become a teacher, obviously. So let's talk about when you came to the U.S. Did you was it your whole family or was it just you? Like, let's talk a little bit about that journey and, you know, what inspired you to to not only come here, but also to stay and to bring your gifts into the UN, which is, you know, really powerful place for you to have found yourself. Yeah, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I came here, there was, you know, my friend told me about this competition they had, she saw it on the paper for people to go to come to the US and study for a master's degree. So there was a competitive examination, followed by psychological tests and to find out how you fit in which university you might fit better and stuff like that. So I told my parents about it and they didn't say anything. So I went to the test and I passed. There were six six girls and I think seven boys who passed. And so we were supposed to go to this training for four months in another town, about 30 kilometers away from my parents, from Algiers, the capital. And um, the day, I didn't say anything until the day came when I was supposed to leave. I packed my bag and I went to say goodbye to my mom. And she said, did you tell your dad you were leaving? And I said, well, I told him a while ago that I'll be going <laughs> on this program. So I went and I said goodbye. He said, oh, you're really going? And I said, yes. <laughs> and I went to that four-month uh, uh, training, and it was an amazing experience already, just uh, that, because um, up, to, up to then, I was really just going from home to to school and back and I was really not socializing a lot and all of a sudden here I was in an apartment with four other girls and meeting all kinds of young people and spending time with them and learning so much plus we had some American professors who came to train us and we learned I think we learned during that four month training more than what I learned at Georgetown for two years (laughs) I mean Maybe I'm exaggerating, but that's how it feels because it was so intense and immersive. Yeah, yeah, it was Mm. really very well organized. Beautiful. Yeah. And then I came here and spent two years at Georgetown. We spent one summer in Boston because we were were doing teacher training at Amherst University. Mm -hmm. That was an amazing experience. And then I was looking for a job and found out through a friend that they were interviewing for an Arabic part-time Arabic teacher three hours a week at the United Nations. And so I went for the interview and did the class demonstration. And I started teaching three hours a week. And a couple of years later, they needed a full-time. There was a full-time position that was open, the first full-time position for an Arabic teacher. And I sat for that exam, interviews, and blah, blah, blah. And And there you are. (laughs) 36 (laughs) years later, I retired. (laughs) After spending all this time teaching all these people from all over the world. Imagine all these people come from all over the world. And they're all really interesting people to learn from you. Mm. But then you learn so much from them too. So it's like it was just a, such an amazing experience. 
Beautiful. Well, yeah, I think that's the beautiful thing. You know, they say when the student is ready, the teacher appears. But I think it's also equally true when the teacher is ready that the student appears too. So, Doraya, let's talk a little bit about you retired in 2017. And now all of a sudden you've got books and a blog and a podcast and a YouTube channel. And so what inspired you at retirement to decide to set yourself up to serve even more people in this way? Well, when I was working, I really enjoyed my job, but somehow it was really hard for me because we have three children. Okay, they're 27, 36, and 40 years old now. It was really hard, you know, bringing up children far away from family. I had no family here. And my husband, you know, we, I had to work full time. My husband had to work full time. Plus he was teaching in the evening. So very often he wouldn't come home till 10 or 11. So I was in charge after coming home to pick them up from school and then make sure they do their homework, take them to their whatever play dates, doctor's appointments, whatever needed to be done. I was exhausted. Mm -hmm. And I always was thinking, wow, after I retire, I can make my own schedule. You know, it's not nine to five anymore. And I can do this and that. I kept, whenever I found something that I thought might be fun to do, I would actually type it in my email and I would type a little code so that when I call up that code, all those things would come up, all the things, the retirement things. (laughs) <laughs> your re- your retirement list of things to do. <laughs> list of things to do because I, I couldn't see myself just sitting at home. And I, I really resent housework because with I was the only- Right from the beginning, home. Doraya. <laughs> I'm not making it their beds. <laughs> I swear. I mean, you know, with four boys and one girl, what happens is the girl is spending all her time with her mom Doing and my mom was a neat freak. She would mm-hmm. wash the floor twice a day, scrub oh the bathrooms every day with Clorox. <laughs> she would iron everything, underwear, napkins, everything had to be ironed. Sounds like my mom. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's too much ha- housework, and mm-hmm. I, I think I spent most of my youth doing housework. Mm-hmm. So I was ready to do things that I really enjoy. And so I started by, I think the first thing I did was start my YouTube channel. Nice. And because I thought, you know, it was a good way for me to connect with learners around the world. And then I started my podcast, another way to connect with people. Mm -hmm. And then my, I don't know which one came first, was it the podcast or the blog? But anyway, and then I thought, why not publish some of the stuff that I am teaching, I could connect them, you know, so people right. can have something in writing, but also be able to listen to it and also read with me on YouTube. Beautiful. So- we're going to take a break right now. Okay. And when we come back, we're going to talk about your book because All right. <laughs> I, I love the story about your book. And right now, though, we could leave smart women. We could use your help. If you're enjoying this podcast, please consider joining our community, making a donation at www.wickedlysmartwomen.com and sharing with your lovely lady friends who might benefit from our content. Please help a gal out and let your sisters, mothers, daughters, friends, and colleagues know about the show so that we can serve them too. I want to celebrate, we just found out, we won our ninth award in the 29th Annual Communicator Award. So we're celebrating that. And I do want to say a huge thank you to all of our listeners who are downloading, rating, and reviewing. We're welcoming thousands and thousands of downloads from all over the world. Let us shout out this week to our listeners in Morocco, which I know they're on the list here. And I do believe we also have Algeria on the list. And we might as well shout out to our listeners. There's Morocco. We might as well shout out to our listeners in New York as well. (laughs) And if you would like to send a shout out, Toraya, in Arabic to our listeners in all of the Arabic speaking countries, go ahead and say shout out to all of our listeners. Okay. Marhaban bikum jamian fi hadha al-barnamaj wa la tansaw an tushariku asdiqa'akum. I just said welcome to this program, everyone. Don't forget to share with your friends. Beautiful. Well, thank you for doing that. And we will be right back with Toraya Ben Farhat.
The Wickedly Smart Women podcast is brought to you by The Wealthy Life Mentor. Women, are you on the edge knowing that life is calling you to make a change? Are you ready to be part of the evolution of what it means to be a wickedly smart woman creating your wealthy life by design, a life that is an extraordinary work of art? Angel B. Hartwell, the Wealthy Life Mentor, is hired by women in transition, women just like you who want to break through to their brilliance, become clear on the value of their wisdom, and embody a beauty-filled, balanced life of shameless self-expression. Discover your Wealthy Life readiness by taking the quiz at quiz.wealthylifementor.com. And we are back with Turaya Benferhat. She can be found at turayabenferhat.com. And we will have that link for you in the show notes. So before we went to the break, we were talking about how Turaya made the decision to retire and had this gigantic email list of fun things that she could do after she retired, which included a blog, a podcast, a YouTube channel, and book writing. So Let's talk a little bit about your business, Turaya, and your book and whatever you'd like to share with us specifically about the book that you have written called, in Arabic, I Am Iraqi. Well, yes. So I had a student at the UN who, after I retired, contacted me and said she wanted to take private lessons. So I continued teaching her until her son decided he wanted to learn Arabic because his grandpa is an Iraqi Jew who moved from Iraq to emigrated to the U.S. when he was 18. And then I started teaching her dad, who's 92 now, (laughs) French, because he wanted to refresh his French. But then Vince, the young boy, learned how to read and write. And I thought, I need to publish something, some book that actually a book that I would have liked to have when my kids were little, because once you teach them the alphabet and you teach that they already know a lot of vocabulary and they can make short sentences, it's good for them to have a book of paragraphs about themselves, about their friends, about their school, about their hobbies, their family, and then a place where they can either rewrite this paragraph or do a closed test or answer questions about the paragraph, a place where they can draw something, you know, a memory from this area of their life. A book for parents who need a book for Sunday school. You know, if you can do something like this with your child, you have 20 chapters. It's a short chapter. They can listen to it. They can read it. They can, you can work with them and it can really add up. And by the end of the book, they really learn a lot and become more confident with the language. So I published this book. I asked Vince about all these things in his life, but then there is a place in the book where every child, any child can write about their life in the same vein. And I have the translation in the end of the book. I also have the paragraphs in Arabic, in with all the declensions, because the declensions, I mean the diacritics, because Arabic has, you know, I don't know if you know this, but in Arabic, the short vowels are usually not written in a newspaper or a book. You're you're supposed to be reading without the sh- the vowel, the short vowels. It's as if you had like English words with no vowels inside, and you have to guess what the vowels are. So Arabic, in fact, is a language that you have to know a lot about before you can actually read a newspaper, because a word without vowels could be five different words, depending on where it is in the sentence, depending on the context. Wow. Okay. So, so it's very important for a child to have these texts with the diacritics, because at that age, it's it's harder to read. So the diacritics are the actual words with the vowels in them. With the vowels, yeah. Yeah, and interesting. The vowels in Arabic are above or below the consonant. They're not like inside the word. Like Interesting. In- <laughs> it's yeah. fascinating. It's such a fascinating topic. And, you know, one of the things that I do want to talk a little bit about with you, Toraya, is this idea of also, you know, just being multilingual in such a 
the world that we're in right now, especially for those of us who are in the U.S., there's this whole idea of English being the only language, and it's certainly not the only language. So I'd love to have you speak a little bit about, you know, what your point of view is on the importance of learning other languages and cultures and being multilingual. I think learning other languages is is very enriching because I know for a fact that with every language I learned, my brain opened up up to not just the language, but the culture. And it it's as if I were embracing a whole new group of people in my arms. Anytime you you greet someone in their own, even just greeting them in their own language, you can see their eyes light up. They open up to you in a way that I don't think can happen any other way. It's very special. And I really encourage everyone to study another language. I think foreign languages open many doors in our lives. I think you have an edge if you have another language or two when you're applying for a job. I think people know this, even though they know that English, maybe you can, you know, you can get along with only English, but having other languages really makes you a special person. Mm. Plus, it's good for your brain. <laughs> Lots of neural networks getting formed yes. when we when we learn how to say bonjour and comment allez-vous aujourd'hui and yes. hello, teach us hello in Arabic, Toraya. So there are several ways, but the easiest way, the easiest one, I think, is ahlan. 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 Ahlan, Toraya. Ahlan is ahlan. <laughs> Beautiful. You know what it means? No, I don't. So ahlan comes from the word ahl, which means family. Oh. So ahlan, the n at the end is an adverbial, is an adverb maker. So ahlan means, it's as if you were saying in English, family li, right? The li at the end is adverb maker. And it means basically, consider yourself part of my family. Oh, I love that. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> that is beautiful. Well, and you know, that's the other thing, Thiraya, about learning about other cultures and learning about other people is there's so much beauty. There's so much beauty that is available that is not if you stay closed-minded and strictly within your own world and your own culture. So I'm really excited that you came today. I have We only have a couple more minutes left. So in the last couple of minutes, Duraya, what I'd love to have you do is just share, like, who are the people that are your clients now? Who are you helping to learn either Arabic or French or Spanish or maybe even English? So basically, these are, I don't really advertise. I have a school online, but they don't advertise and I have no money to advertise. So basically, it's people who know me, my students or people that they met or they, they that asked them if they knew of a good teacher. So they knew where to find a good teacher. Beautiful. Yeah. Can people find out about learning from you on your website, though, that we're going to have yes. in the show notes? Great. Yes. So if somebody listens, I mean, we have listeners in 108 countries. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I teach on Zoom. I, I do everything online. Beautiful. Uh, so COVID, you, COVID has freed us of commuting. <laughs> no doubt about it. I actually was free of commuting in 2008. And you. so... I have not gone back, but it definitely, COVID definitely liberated a lot of people. So in the last couple of minutes that we have, Duraya, is there anything else that you really would like to say or make sure that our listeners hear from you about your business, about being multilingual, about you? Yes. Okay. Well, I told you about my kids. I wanted to make sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> one is a lawyer, one is a psychiatrist, and my daughter is a director in an administration in the city of New York. I'm very proud of them. And they are multilingual, all of them. And I'm so happy about that because you see how many more people they can hug <laughs> just Aww. like that, right? But I wanted to say that this is not actually my only book. I published, I think now I have 26. They're not, you know, what you, you could call them journals. Some, some of them are notebooks. Like, for example, my first book was how to, it's called In Arabic, I Love You. 
It's, in fact, I'll send you a copy. Oh, I'll receive. <laughs> with, with a dedication. I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> and so basically, my students, the thing I remember the most about my students is they would often ask, everybody would ask, how do you say I love you in Arabic? Mm. For many different reasons, you know, but, and, and I would start to explain because it's not as simple as you think. In Arabic, we have many dialects. And since I love you is a colloquial expression, it's something you say. It's not something you write in a book or give in the news. That's where standard Arabic is. So I would start explaining and the difference between different countries and so on. They said, you should write a book. They said that so many times. I decided, hey, I should write a book. <laughs> so I wrote a book that, that's a, a, a brief introduction to the Arabic language with explanation of the sounds, of the writing system, and then how to say I love you in standard Arabic, but also in every dialect. There are 23 countries, so and also a special expression per country, a funny or interesting expression. Beautiful. And I wrote that book. And then I wrote from that book, what I did is I took, there are four main Arabic dialects. So I took the expressions from each group and I made notebooks, you know, just lined notebooks where you have a love expression at the top with a with the transliteration and then an explanation on the bottom. It's a nice gift, you know, to give Aww, someone. To tell beautiful. them I love you, you know. Oh, that's and beautiful. I wrote some children's books and some Aww. coloring books in different well, we... bilingual, trilingual. Beautiful. Encouraging people to learn foreign languages. I love it. Well, we love you, Thoraya, for your enthusiasm for helping others to learn, at the very least, how to say I love you in a lot of different languages. <laughs> and listeners, we are at the end, and we love feedback. So please let us know what you thought of today's episode. Go right now to www.wickedlysmartwomen.com to join our community, share your takeaways, ask questions, or submit guest suggestions. Thank you so much for tuning in. Keep your ears open. And remember, you are a wonderful woman. Thanks for tuning in, downloading, and listening. Be sure to rate and review Wickedly Smart Women on Apple Podcasts and share with other women who can benefit from today's episode. Wickedly Smart Women is the premier podcast series for informing, activating, and inspiring the leader who carries profound wisdom and knows that now is the time to welcome wealth. We welcome your feedback and guest suggestions and invite you to subscribe to our mailing list to be notified of each new episode at wickedlysmartwomen.com.